Explicity Cast from Explicity. What I hate most. I hate that because of her I failed my final year exams in college. The study table in my room was unfortunately positioned in a way that gave me an excellent view into the next house, into a strategic part of her bedroom, the corner that served as both dressing room and undressing room. I use the word unfortunate because it pushed my life in a direction I hadn't planned. I hate how all his life he is blamed what he does which is run a business neither big nor small just a very high on headache and low on profits business of running a small fancy light showroom on meeting me if he'd spent the last few months of his bcom actually looking into his books and not at the playboy magazines he always hid inside his books and definitely not peering through the crack in the curtains of my bedroom he could have been whatever he wanted a professional at least I hate that she has always been so partial to wear, always turning this way and that, preening before that mirror, flaunting those buxom curves, those wide hips in her right, in her tight red satiny kurtas, every line in her body shining, catching the light, reeling me in. I hate that he has always justified and made excuses for his own weakness for dusky skin, especially dusky skin in red. It was me, he said, and the conniving of my mother. which was responsible for trapping him so early in a marriage when the truth is he couldn't have been happier when his father found my photos hidden inside each of his books and insisted that he start a business and get married straight away i hate that even in the throes of fashion in the night in the days that it used to happen her raw inspiring thighs could be wrapped around my waist squeezing me eyes shut tight yet still she could continue talking silence the woman doesn't know what it means I hate that in all the 29 years we have been married he's always simultaneously reading a newspaper and listening to me or looking at his account books and listening to me or watching his stupid cricket and refilling his drink and listening to me sometimes i wonder if he's only pretending to listen to me the only time i can get his undivided attention is when he is in bed with me and then he complains i don't have anything interesting to say to him well you tell me when do i fit in talking about other important things like what wedding gift to send his cousin sister or when he plans to fix a fo- broken flush i hate how she keeps asking me to do idiotic jobs that she thinks a man should do when she and i both know i can leave the shop only after i've checked everything the petty cash got the boys to lock lock up and then reach home only at 8:30 or 9 every night we both know who's going to take care of these things and i don't think it's too much to ask from her for the life of leisure she has I hate that he thinks I do nothing, absolutely nothing with my day except sit on the phone or go shopping in malls with my friends. Who has gone and taken his father for physiotherapy every day for months on end? Who has devoted hours to his sister and got her out of her depression when her husband wanted that divorce? Who attended every single marriage, every single death ceremony for every single distant relative on his side of the family too? Left to him, we would have no contact with society at all. All he wants is to just come back home and sit in front of the TV. day after day never go out anywhere not even for a soup to a chinese restaurant i hate that she asks me the same question every single year just around her anniversary time do you love me is that something to wonder about when you've shared the same bed every night night after night even through the times she has declared a cold war it's all because of these romances she keeps reading i hate how even today it hurts because like a fool i want him to say something different something from his heart just once to me but every time once in the year when i tell myself i'll ask him once more just this last time do you love me he looks surprised as if it's so immature of me to want to know what kind of silly question is that that's his answer every single year as any writer will tell you the most difficult prose to write is the prose that is easiest to read writing on weighty matters is easy if you are well informed on such weighty matters that is but any honest writer will admit in a cloud of envy laced with that silver lining of admiration that supermarket paperbacks such as who done it and stories for kids are exceptionally difficult to write even more difficult potboiler romances My guest today is Milan Vora, a writer to be so admired. 
About 10 years ago, she was the author of the first Mills and Boone romance authored and published in India. This was no easy achievement. For years, Mills and Boone has had its principally female readership in its thrall. Several women have described these romances to me as a rite of passage sort of thing. They say it starts around the coming of age and doesn't stop. Of course, Curious men have immersed themselves discreetly in these romantic novels and sadly learnt nothing. Millen's writing is neither fluffy nor sugary. Her writing often pulls to the darker side of emotions and her novels lurk in that murky junction of sex, infatuation and all other human complexities. When you add in her quick and underlying humour, the mix is something with which regular humans can relate. Now that I have laid bare her soul, let's meet the person. It is my pleasure, Milan Bora, to welcome you to the literary city. Thank you, Ramji. <laughs> You're more than welcome. Now that passage that you just read, where's it from? Uh, Ramji, that's, um, that's the start of the story called What I Hate Most. Uh, the interesting thing was this was an anthology that was, uh, you know, a uh, HarperCollins anthology called Not For Keeps, not as in K-N-O-T, Not For Keeps. And it was around the theme of marriage. And, uh, you know, uh, it was expected that I would write romance. And I wanted to look at romance from the point of view of, of hate, uh, especially a couple that's lived a long time with each other. You know, and to see if I could use that emotion to to eventually maybe bring out uh, love. You know what they say, infatuation leads to love, uh -huh. love can lead to marriage. And over the years, that love starts to manifest itself and develop into something much deeper, much more lasting. Hate. <laughs> yeah. Also, because, you know, with these you know, the years that we've spent, all of us uh, in close proximity with people. I think it's also brought out, you know, extremes in terms of being with somebody too long, you know, the irritants that build up or being distanced from somebody. Um, so those kind of things uh, also leave you with this whole thing of, you know, don't, don't, don't wait too long kind of thing also, you know, don't, don't let all these things fester. Um, so when you read the story, you will, you will, uh, you know, be left with that sense of, you uh, don't wait too long. Yeah. Well, you didn't wait too long to copy the DM now, did you? <laughs> By this, I mean that your first book was the first Mills and Boone novel. Now, that is something of an achievement in itself. Right. <laughs> which was what, about 20 years ago? No, 10 actually. <laughs> what, 10? Okay. Yeah. Now, that book was titled The Love Asana, correct? Yes. But there was already a book on love asanas, the Kama Sutra. <laughs> no, that didn't involve, I mean, Kama Sutra doesn't involve love. You, know, you don't have to be in love to be, you know, practicing uh, all of the, the wise teachings. <laughs> well, that's the sort of romance novel I understand. <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe that's probably the one, the only one that's that's in the here and now. There, you get it. <laughs> now, how did you come to write India's first Mills and Boone novel? People had been forwarding this, uh, you know, stuff about this contest by Harlequin UK looking for a Mills and Boone author for India. So Harlequin ran a contest to find an author. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Tell me more. So th this was a contest looking for the first Indian Mills and Boone author. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I didn't realize either that it was a big, really big deal for them and, you know, for all romance readers in, in uh, India, you know, who've grown up generations and generations of women who were, you know, getting stacks of books from their libraries, you know, suddenly there was going to be uh, a book that, you know, had uh, Indian endearments <laughs> and all of that. So I didn't realize that. I just uh, wrote the story. It was absolutely... I mean, it was unfettered. I was just writing with, you know, without, uh, you know, censoring myself at all. What did you write for the contest? A short story. You know, the story just happened. It flowed. I had been learning yoga. It was terribly boring. So while I'd been learning boring yoga, I'd been thinking it was so much more exciting to have a, you know, a, a story around an exciting yoga trainer and look at what happens with that. Ah, I see the fantasy. Yeah. The hot, stereotypical Hollywood yoga teacher. Mm -hmm. But then again, mm. I know nothing of Mills and Boone. 
Yeah, yeah, so you say. So you say, so you say, come on, tell us. Uh, you had sisters and mums who read them, Ramji. And girlfriends also who read those books, but I didn't. Yeah, 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 yeah. I confess, I tried to read one book, but I didn't finish it. Oh, why do you have me here then? For sheer admiration. Writing a Mills and Boone is very, very difficult. Formula or otherwise, the people at Mills and Boone certainly got it right. But they know their stuff, you know. That, that's the thing I learned when, when I started, when I won the contest and then I had to uh, interact with the editors in UK. Um, you know, I, and I, again, you know, it's like there was a two-way learning process. Uh, they had never been to India. They had no India sensitivity. Um, I had no idea, you know, I mean, you knew what you enjoyed when you watched a romance or read a romance, but I had no idea what it took, right? You never sort of deconstructed it and said, okay, uh, you know, these are important things to look at. I need to really get into um, the characters and their uh, their journeys and what's holding them back. And and I think that what Harley Quinn uh, has really mastered, just as, as Disney and Pixar, you know, they know what they're doing. That's the reason they're, they're the boss of what they're doing, you know, so... Was your book a pink Mills and Boone or a blue Mills and Boone? <laughs> well, you know, um, we had a lot of discussion about this because uh, Harley Quinn would have liked me to make it blue. I wanted it to be pink. And, uh, Tell us what the difference is. <laughs> there, are, um, there are the pink covers, which is, you know, which is romance, romance where, you know, sex is always kind of behind closed doors. It's never kind of... Mm, uh, it's never really uh, explicit. Um, there is a blue series, which is like kind of what they call the international romances. So there's going to be like, you know, high flying affairs and things like that. Right. Okay. Well, Mills and Boone did give you a great start, but you have capitalized so much on that since then. In the course of that journey, who did you read? Who resonated with you? Uh, I'd say that uh, Marianne Keys, who's an Irish author, she, oh, yes. she, I love her I read very much. Very dark subjects, right? Alcoholism, divorce. Yeah, yeah. But funny. Exactly. And and the, the amazing thing, Ramji, is that to be able to take a situation like that mm -hmm. and then to be able to see the humor in it. She, she is just amazing. And she is also somebody who inspires even on social media. I mean, I rarely actually want to see an author... Uh, you know, and uh, somehow sometimes it can be disillusioning, you know, when, when you're seeing too much of somebody on social media and so on. I just want to be able to connect with an author with their work and not really know too much about their lives. But this, this, this lady is just inspiring. She's been very honest, sharing a lot. Um, it's, it's a great person to follow. Now, she wasn't exactly a great fan of the term chiclet. Nobody likes that term. It's just derogatory. But there are also... She once asked if uh, all male writing should be called hmm. dicklet. <laughs> okay. In your upbringing, growing up as the daughter of professors, yeah. what was the environment? Books, books, books? It's amazing how, uh, you know, I had a mom who was teaching literature. My dad, who um, actually had a great love for the language. So, in fact, if anything, I learned of grammar or whatever was always from him because mom couldn't be bothered, you know, trying to teach you grammar and stuff like that. It was this growing up with, you know, hearing um, Yeats or Shakespeare and my bedtime stories with things like King Lear. And, uh, you know. <laughs> King Lear was your bedtime story? Well, most people just have <laughs> Winnie the Pooh. Now, yeah. growing yeah. up with, uh, with academics, the environment couldn't have been too sensorial, could it? Not at all. Not at all, Ramji. Like, it's like people, I used to be amazed when, when I wrote The Mills and Bone, and people would come and ask me things like saying like, oh, so was that like your guilty pleasure and things like that. So, you know, I grew up in a home where, I don't know if you remember this magazine called Debonair. Yes, of course I remember Debonair. I used to write articles in Debonair for a while. <laughs> yeah, really? So I, I grew up in a home where dad would just bring a whole lot of magazines home and everything would be lying around. There was no censoring, including a debonair. Um, there would be comics. There would be, if I if when I read my first Mills and Moon at, you know, uh, at a cousin's place and I, I thought, okay, these are fun. So there was a, there was just a slot in a different appetite for different kinds of reading and different kinds of music. And nothing was, you know, nothing was ever labeled and, you know, um, judged at all. Going to reading right now, most writers have favorite opening lines. What's yours? 
No, I can't have an absolute favorite. There are just so many, Ramji. But if I go back to the ones, the early ones that left a big mark, of course, uh, you know, there was Rebecca. There was last night I dreamt I went to Mandalay. Right, famous opening line. But you know, as an aside, so uh-huh. many people confuse uh, Mandalay, her Mandalay, M A N D E R L E Y, with the Burmese city Mandalay, M A N D A L A Y. But was she one of your favorite yeah. authors too, Du Maurier? Yeah. yeah, I mean that that was you know the early books always leave a big impression, right? There was one that I remember was called as a, I mean, a cheaper by the dozen, which is based on uh, a memoir, which was, that left a big impression. Right, I saw the movie. Then of course, uh, as romances went, I mean Eric Siegel's love story, modern classic. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the opening lines, but I think it was that. What can I say about twenty five year old girl who died that she loved? Uh, uh, Beethoven and Bach and the Beatles and me. Well, nice. Don't stop now. Well, the other one in uh, in recent times is the book I really enjoyed. It's called Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe. And I, I'm sure I'm going to get the author's uh, name pronounced all wrong, but I, it's Ben Benjamin Alire San Sanyes. How do you spell it? Uh, I think it's S A E N Z San. Sanyes. I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's an absolutely beautiful book. It's it's a treasure. And uh, I think it opened with the lines that says, "One summer night, I fell asleep, hoping the world would be different when I woke. In the morning, when I opened my eyes, the world was the same." It's it's an amazing book, and it actually looks at the secrets of the universe, not in the big mega questions, but you know, the little little things, you know, like why does it rain and stuff like that, and in a very poetic way. Going to all these literary festivals, you must have met some pretty interesting people, authors, etc. Which one did you find, and under which rock? Ramji, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I had never thought of myself as being a fangirl person, right? I'm. I'm generally. I mean, everybody thinks I'm this very outward, extrovert kind of person, but I'm actually, you know, I just, I just want to listen and observe, and you know, don't necessarily need to put myself out there and say hey, I need a, you know, autograph or anything. Right. So, who did you fangirl? But this was this was uh, when I'd gone to JLF, I think in 2013. It it so happened that I'd listened to one session in which Howard Jacobson was uh, speaking. Howard Jacobson, the Booker Prize winner. Yes, yes, yes. I was written the Tinkler question. Tinkler question. And so you know, yeah. So in fact, this this helped me also get clear on one thing, you know, because there's a lot of opinion on people say, oh, we don't want to listen to readings, you know, we want to hear authors speak and we want to hear their views. And so this was a session where I think they were talking about humor and you know the the, the different. Shades of humor and the writing of humor. He right. was one of the panelists, and there was Manu Jules and various other uh, authors mm-hmm. who had written humor in that year. Who had you know books that came out that year. Okay. And I mean, even while I thought, yeah, you know, his witty was funny. He was you know had interesting observations. I was listening to all that, and then it so happened that I went to listen to another session where uh, he read something. Okay. And uh, he read a passage where. Uh, you know he talked about uh, this man who had been in a long marriage and then had lost his wife mm-hmm. and uh, his friends had then set up a date for him and when he is in that date with this woman who he's just meeting for the first time and he's uh, the, you know how jacobson was reading that passage and he was uh, you know there was a two parallel narratives of what was happening with the date and what he would have been telling his partner who was no more had even telling her about meeting this woman you know and the whole thing was so it was funny and it was so sad because he just didn't have that lady to you know to to be able to share the observations or the kind of humor the inside humor that you would have with somebody and when when that finished i just i was in, i was so moved and i ran for the first time i ran to the bookshop and i grabbed a copy and i stood in queue you know where everybody else has already been you know people who wanted to get his signature had probably lined up before the session uh, ended you know and yeah it was just it was just important to be able to say i i really love this and i think it also helped me realize that everything else is okay you know you can come and tell me what your politics are and what your views are but it's only your writing that that is going to speak to me as a reader and and that's all actually that that matters so the less i know actually about an author the better you know i hear you okay they say that quotes help literature live on what is your favorite 
Well, uh, I had this whole summer of reading Kafka and Camus. So uh, one of the lines by Camus, which I think was somewhere something I'm paraphrasing, but uh, within me I found uh, I found within me an invincible summer, and I remind myself of that at my lowest times, and and you know somehow pull myself up with that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's ironic about this? Huh? If we rewound this tape and listen to all the examples you've been giving me of quotes and people, there's a certain dark theme running through it. <laughs> and then the first positive quote you give me is Albert Camus. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you, you can't have one without the other, right? Anything works when you're successful. Speaking of which, what according to you is the measure of success for an author? Money, fame? Um, none of those. None of those at all. It's literally, it's just that if you can even in that whole wide universe out there, if you can actually just slightly even touch somebody, um, generate a conversation or leave them with something that may, you know, that left them giggling or left them wanting to reach out and connect. Uh, that That is the only way to say you had any level of success. Yeah. Legions of young men would kill to ask a romantic novelist this question. Do girls see a handsome prince in every frog? No. <laughs> there is no need for any handsome prince uh, or for you to be going around kissing any frog. Just kiss yourself or something. Or really. No romance for reptiles. <laughs> Love yourself, as they say. No, but really, that is the toughest, isn't it? Forget everything else, you know. We spent a lifetime of not loving ourselves and not being taught how to love ourselves. A lot of help that was. <laughs> Milan Bora, thank you so much for joining me on The Literary City. Thank you, Ramji. It's such a pleasure to do this with you. The pleasure was all mine, I insist. Thank you so much. And now for that fun, wholesome segment that we call What's That Word? where we look at phrases and words that we use all the time, but forgotten where they came from. And to help me with it is my co-host. She's fun. Dictionary in one hand, thesaurus in the other. She's going to jump right in and introduce herself. Meet the grumpy grammarian. Hi, my name is Pranithi, but you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. Hello, P with an A. Now, do you remember when we were at Suresh Menon's book launch? Yeah. I heard someone refer to you as P with an A. Do you get that much? <laughs> Everyone. Friends, family. Random strangers at book launches. <laughs> True. I'll live with my new name. But how come you don't have any names people call you by? Oh, man. People call me lots of names. Like, like what? I'm too modest to repeat high praise about myself. <laughs> oh, clever. Yeah, right. That was very, very modest indeed. As I've said for many years, when it comes to modesty, I'm number one, numero uno, the best. <laughs> okay, that is funny. Okay, good. Numero uno is a good segue into what I want to discuss. But go ahead, do your thing. Hello, P with an A. What's the word? First, your interview with Milan Vora. Mm-hmm. I understand now from your interview the complexity of um, writing romance. It's hard. You know, um, we also sort of grew up shying away from Mills and Boons. My mother and friends would make me bring back Mills and Boons for them. And I'd hide and cower so as to not be seen in the romance aisle of the library. But now I'm a fan of Milan and romance writing. I'm betting it's because there were no boys in the romance aisle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the reason. Yeah. And anyway, she seems very smart and you two seem to know each other very well. Yes, she is. And yes, we do. Friends for decades. Back in the 90s, we used to speed ride limericks on pub world napkins. What fun. Why don't people do stuff like that anymore? Ah, uh, each generation to its beer, I suppose. <laughs> Anyway, in your interview with Milan Vora, you used the phrase carpe diem. I knew you would pick up on that. Okay, you first. Go. Yeah, what is commonly known that it's Latin for seize the day, you know, meaning don't let an opportunity slip away. Well, that is a good translation. You gave it the right meaning. Don't let an opportunity slip by. So let's dive into it, numero uno. Tell us all. Well, you got the designation right. <laughs> And you got the meaning right. Subtext, meaning all rolled into one very nicely. No need to explain. 
Okay, the etymology then. Greek it up all you want. There's not much Greek in uh, this one, <laughs> but I will. Mm -hmm. Okay, carpe diem is from the Latin, as you said. Now, you said it sees the day, but technically speaking, it is pluck the day. You know, the literal translation. Mm. And if you persist with seize the day, Latin scholars might seize you by the collar. <laughs> These Latin scholars are psychopaths. <laughs> carpe diem is part of the larger Latin phrase, carpe diem quam minimum credula postero. Now, let's try and break that down. Yes. I suppose quam means how. Yes. And the last part. Minimum credula postero, I guess, translates to very little credibility in one's backside. <laughs> that is funny. Look, this whole thing started with that Greek lyric poet in 63 BC, Quintus Horatius Flaccus. Flaccus. His wife couldn't have been too happy. <laughs> Quintus Horatius, or Horatio, as he was called, then came to be known as Horace, in English references. Yeah. He used the phrase in his Book of Odes, Book 1. Book 1, come to think of it, they must have been pretty desperate in 63 BC with their noses pressed to the window pane, waiting for Book 2 of the Odes. <laughs> they didn't have Netflix back then. No flicks, but they had flaccus. <laughs> and then the poet Robert Herrick used that phrase, and I think with much innuendo. His racy little poem was titled, To the Virgins to Make Much of Time. Mm -hmm. His first lines read, Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a-flying. And if that wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Oh my, that escalated quickly. Or fizzle like flackers. <laughs> And in 1681, Andrew Marvel, you know his family invented Marvel Comics? <laughs> I believe that. High school yearbook, most likely to be a metaphysical poet. <laughs> Irritated that his mistress was not putting out, he wrote, Had we but world enough in time, this coyness lady were no crime. A haiku. Yeah. Hey, you, you claim to be uh, good at speed rating limericks that you were doing at Pub World with Milan. I'll have you know that I used to win limericks competitions in London pubs. Well, oh, then I challenge you now to turn Marvel's poem into a limerick. Me and my big mouth. <laughs> okay, I accept. Here goes. Had we but world enough and time, using the office would be a crime. I could reference old Flaccus, but the boss would still sack us, leaving us with nary a penny a sou or a dime. <laughs> Okay, you deserve the numero uno title, I guess. Oh, thank you, thank you. Moving from limericks to lyric poetry, the phrase carpe diem mm -hmm. began to get a more specific meaning in terms of the pursuit of pleasure. It followed the teachings of that Greek philosopher, Epicurus, you know, the phrase Epicureanism. Yeah, um, Epicureanism, like um, the food thing. Eventually the food thing. Eventually. I sense a what's that word sidebar coming on. <laughs> yes, but only because you asked. In a broad sense, Epicureanism can be thought of as a system of ethics, which then embraces all concepts and forms of life in a system that can be traced back to uh, Epicurus's philosophy. WTF, man. You know, ancient polemics. Oh, right. Ancient polemics. Why didn't you say so in the first place? <laughs> Makes sense. Everything is clear as muddy water. As clear as muddy water. <laughs> okay, I'll explain. The dudes of ancient polemics then equated Epicureanism with hedonism. And that's how carpe diem came to mean take the pleasure, the comfort, and the style while you still can. Ah, I like hedonism. Or is it um, hedonism? It depends. You know how some people give good hedonism. <laughs> Gosh, clearly this Midland Bora interview has set you off. Okay. So there it is, carpe diem, pluck the day. We managed to pluck its meaning and pluck its etymology and pluck its everything. <laughs> yeah, but okay, I'm going to reach into my inner Epicureanism and carpe me some dinner now at KFC. KFC, just make sure that they carpe the chicken fully. <laughs> okay, P with an A in Latin. 
T. Altera Septimana. See you again next week. So if you have a word or a phrase that's keeping you up at night, just reach out to us. You'll find how in the podcast description. And we'd love to have you live on the air and talk to you about it. And that's our show for today. Thank you so much for being here and see you again next Wednesday. Mm-hmm.